I want to share with you out of 1 Kings chapter 18, if you have your Bibles, open up to that. 1 Kings chapter 18, it was Pastor Paul's birthday this week, and we do have a birthday present for him. We're going to give it to him. He's going to be with us in the 11 a.m. service. We're giving him, uh, don't tell him. If you're watching, Pastor Paul, turn it off right now. We're going to get him a coffee makers because uh, he needs more caffeine, right? <laughs> um, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 41 through 46, I'm going to be reading here. And this is what it says. Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. He went up and looked. There is nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, the wind rose, a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. We're beginning our Moving Heaven series this week that we're going to be in for the next several weeks. If I had a subtitle for this first message, it would be, Thy Will Be Done. Thy Will Be Done. Elijah is a powerful figure in Scripture. Um, in many dynamic moments, combative moments, confrontational moments, uh, big moments on, on the world stage of history for the nation of Israel, Elijah was clutch. Elijah was clutch for the people of God. For the people of God. I was, you know, my, my sons would, uh, would say Elijah was sweaty. I was listening to my kids talk in the truck the other day, and uh, my son Kyler was talking to my younger son Levi, and they were talking about how they were going to be playing video games online when we got home, and he was like, yeah, yeah, I'll partner you up with Josh. Yeah, you'll do good with Josh. He's sweaty. And I was like, wait, what, what did you just say? Did I just hear you say sweaty? What does that mean? He's like, oh, that means like, like when the pressure's on, you play real good. You're sweaty. I'm like, all right, that's interesting. What does it mean when you play bad? And my, my other son, Levi, goes, oh, that means you're dog water. I was like, okay. My first point today, be sweaty for Jesus. Don't be dog water. No, that's this is not my first point in the message. Elijah was sweaty for Jesus. But he was a man with no resume. He shows up on the scene. He's a Tishbite. Scholars aren't really 100% sure where that's even from even today. He's got no resume, no background, no, no, no degrees, no diplomas, nothing. But he shows up and he thrusts himself onto the national stage with influential leaders. And despite having no resume, the one thing he did have is he was a man of prayer. He was a man of prayer. And I, I pray we're encouraged this morning with our call to be people of prayer as believers in Christ. Because it qualifies you for a lot more than the world will qualify you for. See, Baal worshipers at the time of Elijah believed that their God made rain. They believed their God made rain, which is quite important in an agrarian society where the economic system is based on farming. And Elijah, apparently he prays for a drought to prove that Yahweh, not Baal, is in charge of crop enriching rains. His prayers move the will of heaven upon the earth. And that's why we want to do this series, this, this Moving Heaven series. It's going to be a message series we have on Sunday. And it's, it's also going to dovetail with the book Intercessory Prayer by Dutch Sheets, as we've talked about. So I want to invite you, if you want to go deeper, grab a copy out in the lobby. We have more copies out in the lobby. And we'll be posting a little reading schedule on our social media each week. It's about two or three chapters a week. So, for example, if you read chapters 1 and 2 this week, you can track with us in the study. And then we also have brand new video-driven group curriculum for our groups to go through together for six, six weeks as well with this Moving Heaven series. And we have a number of our staff and pastors that have taught, taught the video sessions. I'm on there as well. 
And, uh, and it's, it's, it's going to be great content that we, we believe is going to create dynamic settings for you and your group to seek God together and grow in this area of prayer. We have uh, 25 to 30 groups that are launching this week. And we have groups that are meeting in homes uh, here locally, groups meeting in Henderson. We got groups meeting in cafes. We have, uh, we got a, a new mom's group that my wife is leading, Camille. She's leading a mom's group. We got men's groups. We got women's groups. We got young adult groups. We got married groups. Check out the group direct. We got all kinds of groups. And we have the information. I believe we have a printed directory in the lobby. They're also online as well. And that's why we're having... Uh, our, our group launch out there in the lobby after service with some tacos is if you're not in a group, we want to give you a chance to connect with a group host face-to-face out there in the lobby after service. But look through the group options and, and find a group that works for you. They're meeting on all different days and times of the week, all different places, parts of the city. And we believe there's a group for you that you can connect with and grow in these next few weeks. And it's the only way you're going to get access to some of this new content we're developing by being a part of a moving heaven group uh, in these next several weeks. If, if you know a few people, you got a few friends or family members, you want to start a group, we got some grab and go kits here. We won't have time to publish your group, but if you got some people that you want to invite out to a group and grow together with, grab, uh, talk to Pastor Tina out in the lobby. Pastor Tina is right here. Wave your hand, Tina. Pastor Tina is doing an amazing job with her team organizing all of this. And, uh, Grab a kit and and get a group going with some friends and family members and grow together. Amen? Dutch Sheets says this in his book, Intercessory Prayer, on page 149. He said, even though it was God's will to bring the rain and it was also God's time for the rain, someone on earth still had to birth it through prayer. Even though it's God's will, someone still had to take up that charge and pray it into the earth. That's what we want to talk about today. Our call as believers to prayer. Prayer has been a journey for me ever since I got saved at this church. When I gave my life to the Lord at this church when I was 15 years old, I had a Catholic background. And so I I would kneel by my bedside and I would say a number of Hail Marys and Our Fathers every night before I went to bed. And this was my concept of prayer was that the more numbers of Hail Marys and the more numbers of Our Father, that was my spiritual maturity going up. Praise God. Praise God for that. That's not the worst thing in the world to be a part of, but it, but it was a form of godliness. It wasn't the power, to be, just to be honest with you. And when I gave my life to Christ, I learned I could have a personal relationship with Jesus. And I learned I, I, I could talk to him like I, I, I talk to people. And it helped me to be honest with him and helped me to connect with him. And then as God was moving here at our awesome church. I, I learned about worship. And I, I began to worship in my bedroom as a teenager. And I remember one of the first times I was worshiping, I think I had the old Lindell Cooley Brownsville Revival CD. Come on, I just took some of you back right now. Come on. Some of you just went to a place you haven't been in a long time. You're welcome. And it was, I, I got the CD because I wanted one song. Our God is an awesome God. Because I could sing it without looking at lyrics. It was, that's, how, that's how awesome I was as a worshiper. I, I know all the words to this song. It's like one line. But I'm worshiping in my bedroom, and the presence of God comes into my bedroom. I go, this is like church. Wait a second. I'm having church in my bedroom, and it's not even clean. This is amazing. And as I was worshiping and experiencing the presence of God, and all of a sudden I... Over time, I begin to get burdens on my heart to pray. And I remember beginning to walk around my high school, Cimarron Memorial High School. And for several weeks, I was distracted when I was walking around because I didn't see my peers. I saw souls. And I was filled with a heaviness. Jesus, these people, they they don't know you. You love them. You died for them, and they don't know it. Lord, I want my friends to know you. I want my friends' names to be written in the Lamb's book of life. And I was, had a heaviness that I was praying through. And that process was growing me. And that process was birthing vision in me. Because I wasn't out there for Jesus yet in, in all ways. But that process began to birth something in me. 
And it began to open up doors of ministry for me with my friends. As I was praying and interceding, I'd come to youth group and I would just intercede for my campus during uh, youth worship. Come on, Kristen. Planet X. But as I was praying, doors, were, doors of ministry were opening up. And I was growing in prayer, and I was going to Pastor Denise Goulet prayer meetings, and I was growing in prayer that way too. Praise God for Pastor Denise. She was a big influence in my life on learning how to pray and intercede and seeking God. And it was interesting that um, as I've worked at different churches, you know, three other churches over the years, you know, you know usually I was executive pastor, groups pastor uh, type of job description, and it was never talked about, you know, overseeing prayer when I was going through an interview process and getting a new job. Uh, but eventually, every church I worked at, I somehow got put in charge of prayer eventually. It just seemed to always find its way to my plate, and I enjoyed it. And I was o o always overseeing, uh, you know, prayer meetings and, and different prayer dynamics. The last pastor I worked with, Pastor Nate, you know, he said to me, he said, you know, you're one of my only staff pastors that come back to me and talk to me about the presence of God in a meeting. Because I would text him, man, the presence of God was really strong tonight. Man, the river of God was flowing at the altar. He goes, you know, you're the only staff pastor that comes back and talks to me about that stuff. But it, it, it's been a journey for me in prayer of, of starting just as an as a ex-Catholic to now and realizing we can interact with heaven. And the more I interact with heaven, his heart gets close to my heart. And I'm not praying from my head. I'm not praying from a list. I use those things. I use discipline. I, I, I use repetition. But at the end of the day, I'm praying from my heart that's in fellowship with heaven. And it's a place of life. It's a place. It's easy to pray. It's a, it's a place that can make me late for work if I don't pay attention to the clock in the morning. Literally. When it comes to prayer, I want to ask you this morning. Are you empowered or do you feel powerless? Are you empowered or do you feel powerless? Now, we know the Sunday school answer that. I'm empowered in Jesus. Amen. Now, let me ask you again. Right now, in your life, in this season, where you're at, this past week, do you feel empowered in prayer or do you feel powerless? And if you feel powerless, that's okay. It's okay to be real with God this morning. Start by being real with God. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And I want to talk to you out of this passage about four cycles of prayer and intercession. Four cycles of prayer and intercession. Here's the first one. His will is waiting to be downloaded by our will. His will is waiting to be downloaded by our will. We read 1 Kings 18. Let me, let me give you a, a, the, the prequel scene uh, before uh, 1 Kings 17.1. Now Elijah the Tishbite uh, from Tish, Tishbe, Tish, one of those two, in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Wow. This is something that Elijah had received from God. This was a revelation that God had spoken to Elijah. This was not Elijah's idea. This was God's idea to shut off the rain in the land for three and a half years because of idolatry to Baal. It was God's idea to release the outpouring on the land after Baal and the false prophets had been confronted and removed from the land. These were not Elijah's ideas. These were God's ideas that had been downloaded into Elijah's heart. Let me ask you a question. You ever try to pull up driving directions on your phone and you, you've lost your signal? You ever had that experience? I've had that experience. And the problem with that experience is, is really simple. I am a man. And so I try to continue to drive even though I don't know where I'm going. Because one of the worst traumas to the fragile male ego, if you didn't know this, is pulling over and asking someone for directions. Because I am a man, and I know where I'm going. So I keep driving down the road, missing an interchange, missing an exit, missing a turn, driving right by my destination, lost. My wife is sitting there in the passenger seat, I, I, can, I can feel it. I'm spiritual, somewhat still in that moment. 
I can feel, I got the, I, I got the word, I know what she's thinking, I hear the, I hear the deep, do you want to pull over and ask someone for directions? But I want to testify, guys, I am a mature Christian man of God pastor, and so I give a very good response. Leave me alone, woman, I know where I'm going. <laughs> Praise God. That has happened a couple times. But in the moment, it's just, no, I'm not pulling over. But, you know, we can do that in life. We can do that in life. We can lose connection with God, and we can keep driving down the road of life, making decision after decision after decision. Hey, maybe I'll start a new business. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll ask my coworker to be a partner with me. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And then you're having financial issues, and then you go to God and say, God, why aren't you being faithful? I don't understand. You never asked him about that. He didn't give you that idea. Single people, that person you're thinking about dating, have you prayed to God about that? If it hits a rough patch, don't be mad at Jesus if you never talk to him about it beforehand. Parents. Parents, how have you taken time to seek God for the development of your children spiritually, emotionally, intellectually? Have you taken time to say, God, can you show me how to lead my family? Too many times we've lost our signal, but we're still driving. We're still going right down the road. And then we say, God, how, how did I get lost? God, how did we get here? God's saying, yeah, I'm waiting for you to come to me. I'm waiting to speak to you. I'm waiting for your will to want to download my will from heaven into your hearts. See, my job as a pastor is not to make decisions for you. I, I, I like to provide counsel. I like to meet with people. But when I meet with people, unless it's something really obvious, unless it's something really blatant, some black and white sin obedience issue, my goal as a pastor is to help increase perspective in someone's life. Because I want them, I want to lead them through a process in their relationship with Jesus and in their discernment and in their decision making to make a decision on their own, in their own walk with God. I don't want to tell you what house you should buy. I don't want to tell you what car you should buy. I don't want to make every decision for your life. That would be controlling. And if you're ever at a church like that, you should not go to that church. Because my job as a pastor is to disciple you to have a personal relationship with Jesus so that you can be led by the Lord in your own life. That's my job as a pastor. John 10, 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Don't be too busy in 2022 to hear his voice. You have to have a will that wants and waits upon his will. Are you waiting upon him in your life? Because Elijah was. Elijah was waiting upon him. Elijah was seeing the, the terrible things that were happening in his nation. And he was waiting upon God. And he called a drought. And eventually he called an outpouring. Number two, his will on earth is preceded by our prayers of intercession. His will being accomplished in the earth, before his will is accomplished in the earth, it is preceded by our prayers and intercession. See, God was ready to demonstrate his superior power over Baal, over the affairs of Israel, but Elijah still had to pray it into the earth. Look at James 5, 16 through 18 says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three, three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gained rain, and the earth produced its crops. He knew God's will. He knew what God wanted to do, but he still prayed earnestly for it to come to pass in the earth. Notice it rained for, didn't rain for three and a half years. There was a purpose that it was to counter any argument that it was a seasonal drought. You can't claim a seasonal drought after three and a half years. It was pretty clear that Baal had no power to bless Israel over three and a half years of drought. 
you know, I, I was thinking of this, this uh, amazing leader as, as we're in um, Black History Month here in February in our country, and I thought of William Seymour. William Seymour was an amazing man of God. He led the Azusa Street Revival which was an amazing outpouring of the Spirit of God that happened in Los Angeles, but it extended way beyond Los Angeles. It went global. And what happened there has blessed us here today. It's part of the reason we are here today because of what God did through William Seymour and his ministry. And it's written about William Seymour. It says he spent a lot of time in prayer and in fasting, going on to be known as a man of uncommon prayerfulness. Seymour was described as humble, quiet, and soft-spoken. William Durham said of him, he walks and talks with God. His power is in his weakness. He seems to maintain a helpless dependence on God and is as simple-hearted as a child and at the same time is so filled with God that you feel the love and power every time you get near him. Seymour would unconventionally normally sit deep in prayer with his head covered inside of a box. <laughs> He was known as a man of prayer. He, God was doing something inside him, but he knew he needed to pray it through. And even as God was moving and he's, even as his ministry was, was confirmed and validated by what God was doing, he still had to overcome uh, prejudice. And he always had the victory. And he's a great hero of the faith because he was a man of prayer. I think about the famous prayer, the Lord of the Harvest prayer in Matthew 9, 38. We know of the Our Father prayer, but Jesus gave us another prayer in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38. And he says to to ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. It's kind of a funny prayer because you're thinking the Lord of the harvest, it's his harvest. Doesn't he want his harvest to have laborers? Why do I need to ask God to send laborers into his harvest? It seems backwards. Well, the answer is because God doesn't want to move unless we are praying it into the earth. God is omnipotent. God is all-powerful. But in his mystery, and we're going to talk about this in our groups this week, in session one, God has limited himself to our prayers because he wants to be co-laborers with his creation. And he has is, he is called us to represent him in the earth with his authority. And so God wants to move, but he wants it to be preceded by a move of prayer. One of the greatest benefits of small groups is the opportunity for believers to grow in prayer. And I've seen people, I remember uh, we had uh, a sweet lady in our group that Camille and I led in our living room. Her name was uh, Stephanie, and, uh, you know, she was introverted, which I can relate to, but she was so quiet. She was so quiet, and I remember months in, she had been faithfully attending. I could tell she was growing. I I didn't want to ask her a question in the group discussion because I was afraid I would offend her, and she'd never come back to our group because she was so quiet. And, uh, but then I remember when she began to pray in our circle, and I remember seeing her beginning to grow in prayer as she was around other believers who were praying. And I believe that that groups are a great vehicle if prayer is new to you, if praying out loud is new to you, if praying out loud in front of other people, trust me, I know uh, some of you people don't realize that you're you're comfortable in this flow of prayer. There's people, they're still growing in prayer. Groups is a great place to get around other people praying. It's a great place to grow in praying out God's will. Number three, his will is, punches through resistance by our prayerful persistence. His will punches through resistance by our prayerful persistence. See, Elijah took the posture of a woman in childbirth to pray forth the rain into the land. 1 Kings 18, 42, it says that he bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Now, I'm sure for those of you that have given birth to children, this does not sound like a comfortable position. But at the time, this was a common posture uh, for for, uh, giving birth to a child. And we know from the story, it says that he had to pray seven times. Seven in the Bible is the number of completion. We must persevere until God's will is complete. I want you to picture this. They're up on Carmel, but they're not actually at the top of Carmel. They're, at, they're near the top of Carmel. And, and he was, Elijah's up there with his servant, 
Um, he's just confronted the prophets of Baal. He's just removed the prophets of Baal and their idolatry from the land. The drought's been going on for three and a half years. And he, he's hearing from God, I am ready to move. I'm ready to, to, to pour out my rain on the land because of the repentance that is happening. And he's near the top and he says to his servant, he says, go to the top and look for rain. And there was another, there was another uh, peak at the top of Carmel, it was a few minutes from where Elijah was that the servant would have to walk up, and from there he could see west to northwest, which was out towards the Mediterranean Sea, which is usually where the storms would come from over Israel. And so he went up there, and he could see this great scenic view, and he didn't see anything. And so he had to take another few minutes and come back down. He goes, oh, there's nothing going on there, boss. Cool, go back up, check again. Right. So, he so this goes on seven times over the course of about an hour. I'd be like, Lord, could I have Elijah's job? He just has to like, be there and pray. I have to go up and down this mountain. But he's going up and down and up and down, looking and looking and looking and looking and looking. And finally, he comes back and he reports that he sees a cloud the size of a man's hand. And the persistence, the persistence had punched through the resistance in the spiritual realm. And the rain was on its way. I remember being young. I was interning here, and I was interning in the youth ministry. I remember having a dream. And in the dream, uh, we were having our, our, our internship meeting with uh, Pastor Hector, our youth pastor, with our interns. And we were in his house having that meeting. But, but in the dream, we got a phone call. And the phone call was uh, that a master's commission band, that was our ministry training program, had gotten in an accident, and people were hurt. And the, the driver, who was named Jason, was, was, serious, was in serious condition in a hospital. Boom, then I woke up. And I was like, oh, my goodness, what is that? I had no idea of, I wasn't in master's commission at the time, and I didn't know if there was a team out there or whatever, but I just, I, I, it was early, early, early in the morning, and the sun wasn't up yet, and I just got up, and I got down to my knees, and I just began to pray. I began to pray, and I said, Lord, I pray this dream would not come to pass in Jesus' name. Lord, I don't know who's out there and what's going on, but I release your protective angels right now over that situation right now. And I began to pray, and I felt this burden from God. It wasn't hard to pray. I didn't have to push. There, there, was, a, there was a lot of God's heart just moving through me, and I prayed for about 30, 40 minutes, and then all of a sudden, boom, it lifted. Like, it just lifted off me like a weight. It was, phew. I'm like, I don't even know what's going on, but I think it's done. And I went back to bed, and I fell asleep, and I woke up and forgot about it. That's, that, that, okay. So I come to church that day, and it's about noon, and I was, I was leaving my office to go to lunch, and I see the Master's Commission van out there, and I see Jason unloading it. I go, oh, my gosh, they just got back from a trip. That's right, I had a dream about this. And I go up to Jason, I go, dude, and I start telling him the dream. And I tell him the time, and he goes, oh, that's crazy. He's like, that's when I took over driving at that time. I got in the van, I started becoming the driver. I was really tired, I was having trouble staying awake, and, a, and early on as I started driving, we were going up a hill, a two-lane highway, and there was a car coming head-on with me over the top of the hill. And he just passed right in front of me and barely missed the nose of our van. I said, praise God, man, I'm glad you're okay. <laughs> But sometimes you got to press through. Sometimes you got to pray. You got to push. That's what Elijah was doing. He was praying through the resistance to get to the other side of that prayer. Listen, you need to, you need to develop the muscle of persistent prayer. Develop the muscle of persistent prayer. James 5.16 has this little phrase. It says, pray for one another. Pray for one another. Can I tell you this? Sometimes it can be easier to pray for revival than to pray for one another. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Because, you know, praying for one another, it develops the love of God in you. Because sometimes you pray for someone and nothing happens. Sometimes you pray for someone to make good decisions and they make worse decisions. Sometimes you pray for someone and they insult you. They offend you. They wound you. And you're praying for them and God is saying, pray for one another. Pray for one another. And I think one of the greatest things the American church needs to grow in is praying for one another. Praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ that we're in spiritual community with by name. I believe we need to up our persistence in praying for one another. 
That's why I love small groups because I'm praying for one another more often because of the men's group that I'm in on Tuesday mornings. I'm praying for my brothers in Christ throughout the week. I'm praying for their businesses. I'm praying for their marriages. I'm praying for their children because I'm in community with them. Even as a pastor, I need help continuing to pray for one another. So develop the muscles of persistent prayer for one another. Don't get distracted. Don't get discouraged. Are you hitting resistance? Punch back in prayerful resistance. So his will is waiting to be downloaded by our will. His will on earth is preceded by our prayers of intercession. His will punches through resistance by our prayerful persistence. And number four, his will is to pour out the rain of his spirit upon repentance. His will is to pour out the rain of his spirit upon repentance. As the land surrendered itself back to God, it could yield a harvest again. As it surrendered to God, the rains would come, and now it could yield a harvest that it couldn't yield before. And the servant saw a cloud the size of a man's hand. It was a small beginning. But look what happened in Scripture as we read. That small beginning, it made Elijah run. He took off. He, he went all Sonic the Hedgehog, right? And he took off on a 14-mile run to Jezreel. And he actually beat King Ahab in his chariot to getting back to Jezreel on foot. And probably what happened was King Ahab was in a chariot loaded up with uh, royal amenities. And as it began to rain on land that had been through a drought for over three and a half years with dirt and dust and all, it began to get muddy. And Ahab got slowed down and stuck in the mud while Elijah was running. Why was Elijah running? Because of a cloud the size of a man's hand. Zechariah says, do not despise the day of small beginnings. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. You know, one of the things I've learned in, in trying to practice transformational leadership is that you've got to speak life upon life. When there's a little bit of life, you got to speak life into that thing. When there's a little sign of hope, you got to rejoice. You got to praise God. You got to do a little praise dance and thank Jesus for the little bit of progress. You can't wait for the whole thing to get served up for you before you start rejoicing in the promise of God by faith. Elijah saw a cloud the size of a man's hand and he took off. And he beat Ahab back to his back to his palace on foot. I think he had some adrenaline going. I think he was a little hyped up. I think he saw God was moving and, and he was with God. The spirit of God was upon him, but I think he had some adrenaline too. He was a little hyped up. And he took off. What, are the, what does it look like for there to be a cloud the size of a man's hand in what you're seeking God for? Is it already there? Have you, have you overlooked it? Have you dismissed it because of years of disappointment? Because of years of hurt? of disillusionment, maybe there's a cloud the size of a man's hand and God is just waiting for you to recognize it and rejoice for what he's doing. It can be the start of something big. I want to invite the worship team just to come back to the stage. Listen, when, I, when, when God is moving, we got to be ready to run the race. Hebrews, it says to, to run the race, to fix our eyes on Jesus, to let go of the sin that so easily entangles us you got to be ready to run the race when God is ready to start moving. And I'm going to tell you this right now. Some of you, you're battling discouragement. You're battling disillusionment. You're looking at things that have happened in the past, and God is ready to start a new work today. And if you're not careful, you're not going to start running with what he's doing. You're not going to start running because you're going to be preoccupied with the hurt and the discouragement. I'm not trying to be insensitive to that. What I'm saying is sometimes God has already begun the new work before we've grabbed a hold of it. And see, when Elijah started running, it was him receiving what God was doing before it had fully formed and come to pass because it turned into a deluge of rain upon the earth. It's, it was a cloud the size of a man's hand. And it grew into an entire storm. That watered the earth. I was actually going uh, on a prayer walk yesterday because uh, we had some we had some plans. It was in the morning. I was going through a prayer walk in a park nearby our house, and uh, we have a friend from out of town, Sarah, 
uh, one of Camille's friends from our, our, our church in Emmanuel that we served at not too long ago. And so we were going to go out and, and, and do some tourist things and do some fun things, but I want to just pray over this morning. And so I was actually on this point, and God was giving me some notes, and I, was, I got on my phone, and I started writing down some notes about this point, about how he wants to pour out the, the, the rain of his spirit in the land, and I walked right into a sprinkler that sprayed all over me. I was already showered and dressed for the day. I was not happy. I was like, I don't want to get wet. Lord, I'm not ready to get drenched. Uh-oh. Are you ready to get drenched? Are you ready for God to pour out his spirits? Are you ready for God to shift your priorities? We're in a unique hour, church. And my prayer for our church this morning is that no matter where you're at today, you would go to a new level of prayer and intercession in your life. It would get reshuffled and reprioritized in your life. I read a story just yesterday about Elon Musk. He, there was a request from Ukraine to get access to his satellite uplink. He has, uh, he has satellite-driven internet. You have to forgive me. Starlink. And there was a tweet that went out to him, and he tweeted back that the Starlink satellite internet service was now active in Ukraine. There's a billionaire with a couple things going on in his life. A billionaire going on, he's working on uh, going to Mars, electric vehicles, and a number of different projects, tunneling technology and all, and he reshuffled his priorities because of what was going on in the earth. Friends, this is the hour for us as believers. Listen, I see a room full of Elijahs. I don't know where you come from, what your background is, what your job is, what you do Monday through Friday, but let me tell you something. If you're a man or woman of prayer, you can make a difference in the earth. You got to download his will into your will. You got to declare what he's speaking. You got to punch through resistance with some persistence, and I believe we can see a harvest. I mentioned the signs of the end times. You know what one of the signs of the end times is? A great worldwide revival and harvest of souls coming to Jesus, coming to Jesus. And just as the birth pains of the end times are getting closer and closer together, I want to be like Elijah who was birthing the move of God more and more and more in his life. I want to match the warfare of the end times with warfare in the heavenlies. Come on, somebody. Is anybody with me this morning? Jesus, we need you. We need you, Lord. We can't do it without you, God. Come on, if you're an intercessor and you want to pray, you want to seek God, I want you to come down to this altar. Come on. If, you're, if your prayer life has been dormant recently and you need God to spark you, to reignite you, I want you to come down to this altar. You say, man, I'm not familiar with prayer. This is a new world for me. I'm not a strong prayer warrior. I want you to come down and ask God to make you more like Jesus, who's at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us right now. Jesus. Lord, everywhere. him right now. Just begin to praise him. If you have a prayer language, I want you to begin to pray in the Holy Ghost right now. 
Father, I ask you, Lord God, to release a flame of intercession in your people today, Lord. I declare the gifts of the Spirit are going to increase, Lord God. I declare we live under an open heaven in Christ, God, and I ask for more dreams. I ask for more visions. I ask for greater visitations of your presence, God, in the bedrooms, in the living rooms, God, in the car, Lord God, in your house, Lord Jesus. Father, we seek you right now and we declare you are downloading your will into our will come on we don't know what it means right now but we re- i want you to receive it by faith like that cloud the size of a man's hand i want you to receive right now god depositing his will into your hearts hallelujah jesus and we say lord we're here to pray we're here to pray we're going to carve out the time we're going to get up early we're going to stay up late we're going to skip meals lord we're here to pray Father, we want to see you move in Ukraine. We want to see the powers of evil push back, Lord God. We want to see that end time harvest of souls, Lord God, being recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. We want to see that prodigal son and daughter. We want to see that co-worker and that neighbor and that mayor and that governor and that pro. We want to see, Jesus, the testimony of your grace in the earth. Jesus, sing that one more time, one more time. Like a rushing wind, Jesus, be with him. Lord, have your way, Lord, have your way in me. Like a mighty storm, stir within my soul. his identity in you come on you're not a nobody you're not behind the scenes in the spiritual realm you're an intercessor of the most high god you are seated in the heavenly places with christ and he has given you his authority to represent him in the earth and your prayers have power and there is cumulative power from heaven that is building up in this room because of the decisions you are making And so, Lord, I declare these intercessors, Lord God, we send them out, Lord, this week to pray your will into the earth. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. The presence of God is strong here. I want to invite some of our prayer people just to be available at the front. You can stay up here and seek God. You can get prayer. Group posts, uh, you're, you're released to go out to the lobby if you're still in here seek out up here as long as you want and we want you to go out there afterwards if you're not in a group connect with a group host get into a moving heaven group this week we love you church god bless you